every year when we're putting the conference uh, program together, there is a focus at some point within those conversations around what we're doing about leadership, what we're doing about training managers, what are we doing about building capability within the senior teams within organizations. And it is a hot topic, I know, for many, many of you in terms of the work that you do. And we have one of the problems that we've got within, within L&D organizations. I'll share with you a little bit of research, which is that uh, apparently the age at which people are promoted to uh, senior roles within their organizations is 32. It's the average age. The average age for which people get recruited onto leadership development programs, 43. Go figure. So I'm overjoyed that Lloyd has joined us. Lloyd is from AXA. Um, previous to that, he worked with EDF. Lloyd has won numerous awards, or his, him and his team have won numerous awards for the work that they've done, particularly around curating content as well as creating new models and new approaches to design, learning, and development. So join with me and welcome Lloyd Dean to the stage. Thank you for the introduction. So um, I'm excited to have the post-lunch conversation, so hopefully no one drifts off here and keep you engaged. Um, as we just mentioned, I work for AXA, one of their entities here. In between that space, actually, um, with AXA and EDF, I spent some time in consultancy, so got to work with a number of organizations to ratify, if you like, some of the hypotheses I had, which I'll share with you today. Um, and my kind of golden thread is around learning and development. So even before EDF, I was a teacher and teacher trainer, but I've always led people, I've always been very passionate and interested in this. And the goal for me here is to create a point of reflection in the conversation today, as opposed to anything else. I'll share some personal strategies, talk about some of the literature and research in this topic as well. Um, sorry, I wanted to point out that uh, whenever we talk about leadership, we always get the conversation around performance. Uh, my main thing here is to say we need to treat our people as people with dignity and respect because that's what they deserve. And we should hopefully see some increases in performance. My hypothesis is not that we should be empathetic and authentic leaders because it will get us performance, okay? And I want to distinct between, between the two. So uh, during uh, New Year's Eve, this meme was trending. Um, I found it A, quite humorous, but B, I think it captured something that we're all kind of going through. Um, I'm not here to talk about COVID or lockdown, but I'm here to acknowledge that we're kind of still making sense of that. Even today, the Financial Times released some research and data about a number of organizations monitoring how many times people go into the office a day. How are we going to work as hybrid working? But only a year or so ago, 18 months ago, we heard that remote working was, it didn't matter where we were. It didn't matter, all right? And so where, where has this kind of impact fallen on? It's fallen on line managers to have the conversations to make sense with their team members. In a previous organization, they got us from remote back to hybrid, and we asked why, and they couldn't articulate why. I, I, some organizations still can't. So we're still f fighting this. And there's still a kind of uh, impact of COVID being felt on some individuals, some teams, some team managers as well. So that's that kind of conversation. And throughout this period, the expectations of leaders have changed. The antiquated role of a leader being, you know, my way or the highway, purely focused on performance, I don't care, it's, it's gone. Um, if it's not fully gone in some organizations, maybe there's small pockets, but those pockets are slowly waking up, all right? So we need to think about this. But I also think that some of these words are actually quite broad and can sometimes fall into an area of maybe toxic positivity if we're going to talk about things like resilience. So I hope to kind of isolate and break down. But in, in the majority of times, we are trying to do the right things. But even when we're trying to do the right thing, sometimes it doesn't always land. And I promise this is the last meme. I had some fun uh, with this. But I, I just talked to this because I think, A, again, it's quite funny and humorous, but it captures that we're trying to do something in the workplace, but it doesn't always land. If I'm stressed at work, if I've got loads going on at home, 
If the projects aren't, aren't delivering, guess what? The last thing I probably want to do is give my lunch break for, for a wellness session. So we're going to talk about things we can do. And I just want to kind of contextualize some of the things I'm going to say, because language is important, and they can mean th different things to me and you. So first of all, we don't need to be leaders of people for the, for the things I'm going to talk about to have an impact. We might be working in an agile way, in teams of teams. All right? We might have some colleagues we're looking after at the same time. But whatever we're going to talk about, we, we need to be all in. We really do need to care. That should be the heart of working with people. And I'm really quite passionate about that. Um, some of my context, I'm a middle child. I'm one of seven. So that picture of dysfunction is already in your head. I won't say no more. I'm the family therapist. I've also gone through uh, some post-traumatic stress disorder in the past from a car crash. I've been on my own journey, if you like, to define some of the terms we're going to speak about today. I more so know than anyone the impact a line manager can have on an individual in terms of not only their performance at work, but on in their individual lives as well. And when we t talk about well, what are the contexts we're um, referencing here, so it may well be that someone is working or leading on a difficult project, and how do we support them? Okay? It may well be that they've got some childcare issues at home or some care issues they're um, struggling to deal with. Now, if that's our kind of typical bubble, if we start to work out what are some of the other examples, well, it may well be that an individual is on a performance improvement program or plan, sorry. How do we have those honest, authentic conversations with them and, and not use it as a kind of whipping tool? It may well be that someone in, in their family has an illness. It may well be that there's a critical illness. It may well be that you happen to tell someone to reapply for their job. Maybe they're going to lose their job. How do you have those conversations and still be empathetic and come across authentic? It may also well be that there's an illness in the team, maybe bereavement in the team, and you're dealing with a loss. These are all examples I've personally um, led over the last couple of years. And again, I, I think that's really important to land the context, because I'm giving some examples that may not resonate with you. You will have your own. But I'm also here to say, in the context of all of this, we as leaders need to put our oxygen masks on first, like we are told to in a plane. So how do we look after our energy systems? How do we ensure that we're constantly in learning from our experiences so we can help teams and individuals as well? I've mentioned a few of these um, words already, so I just want to land on an agreed definition and talk to some of the importance of them. So empathy, seeing the world through each of our different eyes. I gave some hypothetical examples a minute ago of situations in the workplace each and every one of you would have responded differently because you see the world different. I will be saying things you may agree or disagree. We have different contexts. So how do we ensure that? And we know leaders who are strong um, with empathy help to increase morale in an organization. And there's a number of references I can share at, at the end as well. This piece of research is from, from EY. Authenticity, we, we kind of know this. It's bringing ourselves to work but this is the important part, regardless of context. So I go back to some of those reference points a minute ago. How, do you, how are you going to show up in an authentic way where maybe you can't show the information? Maybe the HR policies tell you what you can and can't do. That's really going to challenge our authenticity. But we know when we get that right, people want to stay in the team. People want to join the team. <laughs> performance is going to be increased as well. I don't want to talk, talk too much about performance because I think we get that. I think traditionally that's where we start. Um, but if we've done the first two things, we're already creating trust, psychological safety uh, in the team as well. But one of the things I want to highlight, just to reinforce what I'm talking about today, is there's an enormous amount of literature that shows our relationship with our line manager not only impacts our psychological well-being, our physical well-being as well. Impacts on heart attacks and our general health. And then the final two points for me here are where I talk about putting our oxygen masks on first, this is what I'm talking about. So resilience, the ability to weather and recover from adversity. And we'll talk about what adversity actually, actually means. There is some research to show that only a third of UK employees feel resilient. And then reflection. It's, common sense is not always common action, right? I think we all know reflective practices are beneficial to us. They help us learn and process information. Another interesting piece of research um, that I've read recently show that employees who reflected on the day ahead, either in the final, like on a Monday evening ahead of Tuesday, or on a Tuesday morning ahead of Tuesday, felt more meaning and purpose, were more connected to, to the workplace as well. But for the purpose of this, when I talk about resilience and reflection, I want to talk about you as leaders and the people you're working with in that ecosystem.
So we've kind of articulated the why, why are we covering this topic? We've agreed on some kind of common definition in language. I want to spend the majority of the time talking about some specific strategies for each and some potential pitfalls. Uh, because I don't think we talk about pitfalls enough. And I'm purposely starting from the bottom and working our, our way up here. So how do we um, put our own oxygen masks on a game? So from a reflect reflective practice perspective, I would encourage us to find a way that suits us. Reflect in a way that suits us and our lives and just try and be consist consistent as possible. I've tried everything from uh, journaling, scribing notes, reflect into chat GPT about a difficult conversation. And by the way, if you're thinking about this, why does this matter? I've spent lots of time with organizations where people have to have quote unquote difficult conversations. This is the number one thing we recommend and it has a direct impact on health. For me personally, I've got a certain set of prompts. How do I feel about a given topic? What do I want to feel about a given topic and what are my actions going to be? Really simple, but that's me, okay? Now, we go back to those earlier contextual uh, scenarios we presented. When you're having some of those conversations with teams, how are we showing up the best way possible? Just turning up is not always the best case. If we then look at resilience, resilience is more than just bouncing back. We mentioned earlier there needed to be some adversity, all right? So we need to respond to something in particular. Some of these are quite common, like diet uh, and nutrition, sleep. So I won't spend too much time on them because there's already uh, time being spent. But for me, one of the, th the things that works really well when we're having some difficult conversations, when I'm dealing with stuff that's way out of my comfort zone, is to focus on optimism, but realistic optimism. So the research will say that optimism itself is not very helpful, to, to bear with me, because we don't consider we might take one on the chin, some bumps in the road. So remember we're having a conversation with someone and they are going to lose their job after reorganizational structure, it takes a lot of courage sometimes to have those conversations one-to-one. -one. How am I going to meet that person in particular? Knowing full well that it may not go perfect for me. I may learn from the scenario and probably in the medium to long term, everything will be hunky-dory. And that's a particular approach I took in, in conversations in the past. So my broader point here is when we use the word resilience, for you, what does it actually mean? Okay. Can we explore that in, in more detail? Then if we've got our kind of um, foundations in place, our energy systems, let, let's then work up. So from an empathy perspective, my, the biggest thing I've discovered uh, over the years is people like to be heard, not told. So how can we, again, easier said than done, but language is really important. So for example, if someone's stressed, if they've got care issues at home, rather than me using language like, you need to do this, or I would recommend you do that. In the first instance, it seems like this is a really important topic to you. And then using a, a long pause. It's simple but effective and it has an impact because we diffuse a situation. On a really sensitive topic, I may have even misinterpreted things. It enables them to clarify and validate with me uh, that conversation as well. Very powerful. From an authenticity perspective, uh, I think it's really important to declare your intent, and I'll talk about some of the pitfalls in a minute. But we work more and more now in environments with strong diversity of thought, and I know I see the world differently to other people, and I know sometimes when I use language, it doesn't always mean the same to me as other people. So I really try and declare my intent, hey, we're going to have this conversation, I want you to know that I'm here to support you. I want to support and drive your performance. Sometimes I'll use language that means something to you, and I want you to focus on the intent rather than the words. Easier said than done. Like seven or eight times out of 10, it works. I'm still working on the other two or three out of 10. But it diffuses a situation. And again, let's remind ourselves, these are for conversations that are normally going to be quite challenging or emotive for the other uh, individual, and sometimes for ourselves uh, as well. And the final one's relatively easy, is we we're on performance, because we all want to get that. And I just want to declare that I am really results orientated, I'm really performance driven, and by the time we've done this, we've looked after ourselves, we've been emotionally mature, we focus on the other person, we should be in a place where we can have some of these honest conversations, ideally. Um, and when we get to that place, some of the open goals would be, I'm going to set goals for individuals, they're going to set their own. No, I, we, we need to create uh, co-create meaningful goals that includes their personal development as well. 
Now, if we work back, I want to talk about some of the pitfalls, because I don't, I honestly, some of you may have heard a lot of this before. Cool, you have your own experiences. Hopefully, you're reflecting. But I don't think we hear about some of the pitfalls and war, um, barriers to some of these things. So we're going to work down from performance. So from a performance perspective, a one-size-fits-all approach. When I was a teacher, we'd have a very simple uh, approach of using a pen portrait. You'd understand the learners over, over time, their preferences, what's going on for them at home. This is something we can do. So we're having the same conversation with the same message. We can differentiate it. So what I've learned is these small tweaks do have a big impact because each of you are individual. Each of you have a different way of seeing the world. From an empathy perspective, if we're going to do this and show up and be all in, guess what? It takes a lot, of, it takes a lot from us. And we need to be aware of our kind of battery from that perspective. I mentioned earlier, for example, some of the PTSD I went through. Uh, and when there was a particular scenario in the team when an individual was critically ill, and um, subsequently we, we had to, as a team, manage dealing with his bereavement and his loss and some other things on the team. I struggled then because I was trying to turn up and show up, but I wasn't putting my oxygen mask on myself. I felt guilty. Why am I talking about these things? Why, why am I making this about me? When actually, if I was mature at that time, I could have done some other things and strategies that would have helped me. Because the, again, the research will show us when we become fatigued in such a way, we become more irritable, less patient. We're kind of doing the things we don't want to do um, that we have set our, our minds on. Would any, well, here we go. This is from a movie, uh, Glass Onion, no, Knives Out Glass Onion, from Benoit Blanc. It's a dangerous thing to mistake speaking without thought for speaking the truth. Uh, it's a warning sign to say, let's be authentic, but it doesn't mean we can say whatever we, we want at any given time. It's not an excuse not to think, okay? Because we know language and words mean something uh, to all of us. Extroverts in particular, I'm sorry to say to you all, are probably more at risk of this because we, I say we, I'm an introvert, uh, extroverts will naturally make sense of the world by speaking out loud. Meanwhile, your team members and your team are like, what the hell are they talking about? Are we going through this reorg, like what? what are you actually saying? When really, we know they're not saying much, they're just figuring stuff out themselves. From a reflective, pra I don't know if you can see that in black, the, the lighting isn't great, but we're 10 years of uh, reflection, without reflection, I should say, it's just one year repeated 10, uh, one, one year repeated 10 times. It's one of my favorite quotes uh, from my, my time studying. And it's just to reinforce that it's super important, all right? How are we learning from these scenarios? What are we doing? How are we taking the time out as leaders? And the final pitfall is, is just around resilience. And in particular, around toxic positivity. I've worked in, uh, still with some team members today who will say, I'm cool, I'm super resilient. I'm like, what does that even mean? What does that, what we know resilience happens in context. It happens when there's a certain amount of adversity applied to that individual. And there's a risk, I think, for, uh, as leaders, if we use these generic words without defining and kind of understanding the, the level of detail beneath with our team. Um, I personally feel there is uh, warning signs on here. We see it in social media. YouTube's a bugbear for me in this particular way. Potentially, it creates perfectionism. So if there are strategies um, and pitfalls, I'm waiting to go on. Yeah, here are my kind of key takeaways uh, from this. First of all, hopefully you've been able to reflect and take something. The key message being, let's treat people in our teams with the dignity and uh, respect they deserve, and we might get some performance increase. Let's not do it because we want performance improvement it increases. Let's do the humane thing. As I've been talking, what I've been trying to articulate and define really is an adult-to-adult -adult environment. It's not to be misconstrued with a parent-child environment, okay? Which, again, I see a lot in the workplace. I've been in teams where I've had that type of feeling, okay? Um, the other aspect I want us to take away is putting our own oxygen mask on first. Listen, from resilience, it might be a daily exercise, mindfulness, whatever it may be, but how do we show up for ourselves in order to show up in the best way possible for our, for our people. And if some of this is going to be new to you and you're going to take something away, just be patient, be prepared to mess up, be prepared to, these things just take time, but just keep going. Uh, I'm sure some of you might have questions now, but thank you for listening to me uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed, Lloyd. So, 
We have time for a few questions. Who has the first question, please? So everybody's finding their... Oh, lady at the back. Have you got, got a microphone? Thank you yeah. very much, Tommy. Cheers. Thank you. I don't have to project. This is great. Um, thank you very much for this. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's the future for every leader. Um, how would you approach um, trying to nurture being authentic as a leader in a company that's maybe a bit too hierarchical mm -hmm. and a bit too, dare I say, maybe old school? So how do you balance being authentic and nurturing that, um, what you say, you know, messing up learning on and repeat with people who don't really maybe get it because of the culture? Very long-winded question. But I no, I get it. it. Uh, trust me, I get it. Um, I think in the first instance, if someone's going to embark on this journey, if you're going to be authentic and empathy. Some of the stuff I mentioned there, dare I say, is a bit fluffy, isn't it? Our colleagues in this scenario might, might say. I think it's understanding where the pockets of good practice already sit. I think understanding people's readiness for change is really um, a useful thing to map out. So where can we start with our low-hanging fruit, so to say, and potentially down the line um, use those to leverage others. I think with some of our antiquated <coughs> colleagues, uh, there's showing versus telling um, and letting them, them see it. I have seen some teams where individuals, or well, the senior leaders, have been very, uh, how can I say, not ripe for change. There's tools like the Lencioni model, and you get the kind of free mapping, and it encourages dialogue in the first instance, and for people to share that. It's a nice way to show objectively if their team members, for example, are prepared to, to share information which sometimes can be a, a nice way to, to hold up the mirror. Um, yeah, that, that's my initial reaction, so hopefully that helps. Th there was another question here as well. Just wait for the microphone and still be with you a second. Cheers. Thank you, Tony. It's great. Thank you. Just stops us having to repeat everything back, which is... Thank you. Okay, maybe I didn't catch it, um, but what is toxic positivity? What do you mean? Sorry. What do you mean by toxic positivity? What I mean by toxic positivity, I think uh, we might use some things sometimes and it can create a sense of overwhelm. So um, let me give you an example. If you follow some things on social media, well, I should get up at five o'clock every morning and drink bulletproof coffee and then write 2,000 words before nine o'clock set. And then I've got to do my mindfulness for 40 minutes, do my job, be a perfect leader, do the school run. So all, there's a sense of pressure, I think, externally, in particular on social media, that's put on, onto us. And for some people, I think it has a detrimental uh, impact. I think, I think simply, simplistically, one of the ways of thinking about toxic positivity is when there are crap things happening within an organisation and the organisation subtly makes it feel like it's our fault that we are not handling it rather than at its problem. So I'll give you an example. This is a story told by John Amici, it's not one of mine. And he said, if you've got a 10 metre by 10 metre box which is full of water and somebody inside it, you can give people some help by giving them an airline periodically and then telling them to hold their breath until you come back with the airline next time round. And a lot of organisations respond to adversity by making it your problem rather than making it the organisation's problem. John Amici's comment was, why don't you spend some time taking the water out of the box? <laughs> and then you don't have to give them the airline. Yeah? So resilience, mindfulness, all of those things, some people really enjoy it, really like it, and it's very, very valuable to them. Where it becomes problematic is when that is a sticking plaster for the organising, not the organisation not changing some of its negative cultures and negative ways of working, which require people to be more resilient as a result. Solve the problem, not blame the individual, is, I guess, part of the issue. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. There's another question here. Yeah. Gentleman in the middle, yeah. Thank you. 
So I guess um, when you were talking about the importance of authenticity, but then also how to sort of have those conversations, I've always found it interesting to know how you sort of have difficult conversations, say, without feeling like you're using a sort of structure or there's a formula yeah. to sort of bring yourself into it so the person doesn't sort of switch off because they feel the person I'm talking to has got a sort of template yeah. as such. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I'm smiling because this is an ongoing, ongoing challenge. For me, I go straight away to some examples in the past. For me, that's where reflective practice really works for me so I can start to prime and go through my own processes and really turn up because in the example where someone... Um, I met this individual and had to inform them they were you know, going to lose, lose their role. And everyone's kind of in the team expecting a similar conversation. And how do I turn up consistently based on our conversations that we have? So if I go back to that kind of pen portrait, you know, this individual would like to go through his things uh, first and we would have a certain structure which would be different to others. So how do I respect that um, and be honest as much as I can be honest, even when I, when I can't be like that? So I think it's... It's a great question, and it requires us to like, think about our own energy systems and emotion before we, we have that um, and be structured about it in our minds. Yeah. Do we have another question? We have a question down the front. Sorry, so we have to get your running shoes on for this, this session. Sorry about that, mate. Um, my question is, um, depending on personality, some leaders may um, achieve this status and be yeah. authentic and empathetic. How do you convince other people more analytic to follow the journey without feeling they are messing up with their personality and their essence, I would say. Yeah, it's, um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, this goes back to sharing rather than telling. And even in, in any, let's say if it's a, a peer who's another leader of a, or a particular team and you get the sense they're trying to go on that journey. I think for me, it's just in all of our interactions, really showing up authentically in those scenarios again, but also sharing what doesn't work. I will talk a lot about things I've really messed up on, even when my attempts are really positive, because I think it creates a bit of um, safety uh, as well. So I think that's also uh, important to share. I think there's also a conversation at some point when someone's ready to, have a, to talk about courage and kind of what people want and what are their ambitions. Because I've met lots of people who want to be a leader and want to get promotion into managing people. And sometimes I find, I feel like that's more from a status perspective. <laughs> so to ask them, you know, why do they want, why are they wanting to be a leader? What do they get from, from being a leader? I think is also a useful thing to explore as well. There's a hand up behind you. Hi, you mentioned some of the terminology is a bit fluffy. How do you turn that into kind of a boardroom conversation that highlights the need for this on kind of a organisational change level to, you know, to make it yeah. a burning platform for change rather than it's a nice to have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my glasses keep getting um, <laughs> cut on this. Uh, I think... I think it, it, I'll be surprised if in most... I mean, if I was working in an organisation, every single one in the boardroom was responsive like that, I'd probably be like thinking about moving to a different boardroom, uh, f first of all. But there's certainly going to be individuals. Yeah, there's in every, any, any organisation. You may have picked up, like, I try to be authentic to, my, to myself, and one of the ways I can do that naturally is to, to use... to diffuse and disarm a conversation, potentially with humour or some examples, research or, or whatever else it might be. Um, so that's the first instance. But I think as well, uh, as we kind of alluded to around the Lencioni conversation, any data, facts and insights that, that goes is less broad and could be as specific as possible um, about maybe departments, functions or, or whatnot is quite, quite helpful because what we don't want to do is go to the opposite and say, hey, you, these people in your team are completely different to others, so how do we find that middle ground in there as well? But definitely in that, you'll have your own way of, of doing it, being true to yourself on that journey as well. Do we have another question? It's one at the back. It's all at the back. Of course, it's right at the back. You know? <laughs> You're getting your steps in today. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the next questioner. Okay. <laughs> Don't tell him. Um, so I've just had a horrible moment of reflection. Um, <laughs> um, so <laughs> uh, you did that quote unquote on difficult conversations, and I've heard myself at work recently saying, "I will never give you." a session on difficult conversations because there's no such thing. Now am I being guilty of banning language when you've just talked about the power of language? 
So I'm, I'm just thinking about there's words that we use and that they mean different things to different yeah, yeah, people, yeah. but where's that? I like that contracting bit up front. You're going to hear me say something a certain way. There's a question in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's your thoughts further on, on that use of language and the power of language and where you draw the lines. I think, yes, yeah, super powerful. But I think for me, it comes back to empathy is what do other people think about the language? What do your team members perceive of the language? If that's all, you know, I don't know the dynamic of your particular team. For what it's worth, I define a difficult conversation as a conversation that someone feels quite emotive to have. And that emotion could be whatever it means to them. And it's, that's quite important because the emotion could create avoidance. Um, as well, but in, from, from the perspective of your team, if you're having those contra contracting conversations, you will know your team better. And like I said, if this creates an opportunity to reflect on that, great. I think we're pretty much down to time, and then you know, poor Tom's going to be worn out by the end of it. But the, one of the one of the things is that there are no bad words. There's just lack of clarity. Uh, one of the challenges, you know, what, one of the things that I really liked about this presentation is that Lloyd put up a set of things which talked about empathy and resilience and authenticity and reflection and called them traits. How many times do you hear those referred to as skills? They are not skills. <laughs> They are a collection of behaviours which form a perception which other people have of us and of which we have of ourselves. So be clear about the words that you use, what they mean to you, while allowing, as I think Lloyd was saying there, people to have their own interpretation of what, for example, a difficult conversation is. When I was working with a different insurance company. I'm working with a different insurance company where I was working with them in their contact centers. They said to me, how do we know that a conversation with a customer has been a good conversation or a bad conversation? And I was trying to come up with a rubric for being able to measure this. And they said, we know because we can look at their faces when they put the phone down. And in some cases, do you need to describe that? Do you need to put that into words? Because we know sometimes when the phone goes down, you go, oh, that maybe that was quite tricky. And sometimes when you put the phone down and you go, that that was actually quite successful. And then let's work back from that using some of those things around reflection. So Lloyd, fantastic session. Thank you for that. I'm sure Lloyd's going to be around if you are burning to ask him a personal question. I, a question that you're asking him personally, not, you know, a personal question. But anyway, just being clear about the terminology that I'm using there because <laughs> it seems appropriate. <laughs>